Aho, Wakatanka, Ole, Statu, Wanawi Mahia. is a celebration of, of life. We all come together as one nation. And this is where they talk about the circle that we come in. This is where we meet friends. This is where we make relatives. This is where we bring our children to, in this circle. They call it the circle of life. This is where all good things happen. Do you do lots of powwows during the summer? Yeah, we've been going every weekend for the past six six weeks, I think it was. Really? Yeah. Why would why do you do that? Um because they're powwows. Mm -hmm. I mean, we we don't know life without powwows, you know. I don't see how you guys can live without ever knowing the powwows, you know. Again, we ask you to rise if you are able to. As we bring in our ego staff. When you look at the grand entry, it's a teaching right there. You have the flags that come in, the eagle staffs, and those represent nations, families, communities, and then veterans. We have bringing in our eagle staff. This evening, we have Ernest Wabasha, the military chief of the Dakota Nation. And then we have the elders, and then we've got the adults, and then we have the children. The children have role models all the way down the line. One of the things I was always taught was when our people, when they would go out a raiding or a hunting party, they steal these horses and maybe they'd kill a whole bunch of buffalo or whatever, you know, and they're bringing this meat home. But when they get in sight of the camp, they would stop and they would clean up and put on their finest outfit, you know, and they'd paint up and then they'd come in and they'd show off. You know, they'd come in and they'd ride around the camp showing that they were back, they were okay, and then show off what they brought back. And that's where uh, it was kind of like a grand entry. Oh, what a beautiful grand entry for this Saturday evening. Oh, God, that's a hot entry. Without the beat of the drum, which is our heart, we would not have a power. So it is important that we respect and honor those people that come together to sit around the drum and make a circle, because it is a sacred circle. That all these tribes will bring the heartbeat of their relatives. And that's what the drum is about. But the drum, actually, when it comes, we're looking at families of these men that are sitting around the circle to beat that drum. 
If one weakens, the drum will start falling apart. So they must also be caring. They must also protect one another. They must also support each other. So one has a family, another has a family. Those families become relative. So it goes on and on like that, right around the circle. It never ends. These boys, these men, will then go and uh, adopt a friend. He become relative, and his family become relative to this family, and this whole family group. So it goes on. So the whole nation speaks together, communicates together with the heartbeat of each other. The drum beat represents the richoni, they call it, life. The first form that can take shape in any person or any living being is the heart. Then after that is the physical, so that's second. And the last is the mentality. And today we've lost respect for the heart, they call it. So this heartbeat represents the drum and your heartbeat, the pulse. And if you put those together, it's to rejuvenate. It's, it's to build the spirit back up in you. It reaches out for everybody in the whole circle. And they'll even take the eagles. They'll even bring the thunder beans. They'll even bring the wind. See, that's, when you see these things happen, then you know you've got something very spiritually happening. Listen to the drum, you know, and it calls you. And it happens to me a lot of times. And I say, oh, I'm so tired, I'm going to rest. And all of a sudden, I hear a good song and a good step, you know, and out I go. My wife said, I thought you was tired. I said, the drum said I'm not tired. <laughs> There is a song everywhere, no matter where you go, there is a song. And that's what we're told to listen to. There's songs in the grass, because it is the sacred blanket of Mother Earth in the summertime. And there is songs in the wintertime, when the wind, the wind howls through windows or doors or wherever there is song. There's songs of birds that sing particular songs. And there's words in those songs. Um, all we have to do is learn to listen to them, the great songs of, of Mother Earth. God gave one of the greatest gifts was to sing together. And the beat of that particular song is the drum beat itself, which is your heart. So your heart is your drum beat, and your songs are the gifts of life, the songs of life. You hear a good song um, and you're out there dancing, you kind of go to your inner self and to where you where you had your vision. You go back to the place where you feel comfortable, you know, in your own state of mind and nothing else around you can um, interrupt that. And that's when you hear that song and it's so pretty, you know, it's like, it sounds like the wind and you just, and you um, just dance. To that and it, and it feels good. A real good song, it, it, it just comes into you. It's like in your heart and it just, your body starts, your feet, your legs, your arms, you know, and everything just is um, expressing that song. Oh, 
get that fine clothes, you would have. It takes a long time to uh, make an outfit, you know. You can go through life and keep adding on to that outfit because of different circumstances that surround different items um, that you add to your outfit. You know, the breastplate, a long time ago, before the coming of the Europeans, it could deflect arrows and uh, some spears. And then we wear a choker, which would keep you from getting your, your uh, throat cut. <laughs> We say welcome to each and every one of you, good people. See, my dad made this for me. It was like, um, when a warrior, he had a um, good horse that he really liked to ride and took him to all the, all the pony raids and all the, um, all the war parties. And that horse got old and it died, so then way to remember that horse. It was such a good horse, he'd carve a stick into, the, into that horse and paint it up just like that horse. So he'd always have a, uh, um, something to remember him by, and he'd carry it with him when he danced. Then the mirrors, that's to, like, if anybody has any bad thoughts about you, it's to come and hit the mirrors and bounce back. Like, evil spirits, they see themselves and get scared, and they, they fly away. <laughs> The shield I made about three years ago is just like a hoop stretched with rawhide and tied around there and then decorated. I use acrylic paint on it. And the Thunderbird, he carries all the thunder and the power from the west to, 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 the, um, to the ground. He's the one that brings the rain so that everything can grow again and keep growing. And he's the one that brings the thunder the thunder is like real powerful to the Indian people. So I respected the Thunderbird and the beings of the West. I put him on my shield and the shield protects me. So that thunder and the, um, and the lightning protects me. See how that all ties together? When I was younger, I had a lot of hair. I used to just have a, had a, had a uh, the way I put it on was I had a uh, braid on top of my head, and then it, it went through this hole. But now I got older, my my face is getting moving. <laughs> so I have to uh, tie it on now with a shoestring. <laughs> this piece right here is very, very traditional. That's how the old, like um, way back in the 1800s, that's how they used to style their bustles. And I got it given to me by old elder before he passed away. So. He kind of respected me, and, and I showed respect back to him by wearing it when I danced. The feathers are eagle feathers, because an eagle is said to fly the highest in the sky, carry our um, prayers and our, and our thoughts to Tunkashla, the great spirit above. So that's why we um, we wear the eagle feathers, because they bring us closer to Tunkashla when we dance. And it, This is our oldest uh, dance known to our people. Long ago, our, our uh, warriors would come back to the camp, and the, the way they would uh, let the people know what they had been doing while they were on the way on this uh, hunt, or uh, they're stealing horses, whatever they were from the enemy, they would come back, and then they would, in the circle, in the circle in the middle, they'd have a fire or something at night, they would talk, plus they would act it out. And then they dance and demonstrate how they how they stalk the game or how they track the game. That's what they did, the traditional dancing. How it means that our dancers come together to dance for those that cannot dance. Dance for the old people, dance for the little children. 
so to dance for them means that it just encourages side that their tradition is carrying on. It's not it's not going in the way of the wind. It's still there. So it gives them courage and gives them strength to be here on their mother earth for a little longer to give that wisdom that we have. By 1862, Minnesota had declared itself an Indian free state. And in 1863, uh, in fact, uh, there was a $200 bounty on Sioux scalps. And those Indians who were here uh, were running for their lives. People would, uh, they would have powers, secret powers. They were outlawed for many years. Everything was banned. I mean, not just dances, but the people themselves were banned. There was no way that they could have uh, uh, completely eliminated problems. The people just wouldn't let it happen. They uh, got together and uh, they knew where uh, secret places were and uh, they uh, let each other know by word of mouth where they were going to be and when and uh, they would all show up there. It's our culture and uh, our traditions and uh, our spiritual life. Uh, well, the, our whole way of life. Yeah, uh, kept going that way, kept alive. danced around the edge of wherever the men were dancing. This was mainly in honor of their male relatives that they would do this. The outfit is very much a part of the, the judge's you know, overall picture of a woman's dancing. Uh, you might see the little bag on the, the back of her belt, uh, then the knife case with the knife in it, and then the all case with the all in it. And depending on the style of dress, how is the beadwork applied? And is it done in a, a way that looks expert? This can be geometric design or floral design. You can tell the difference between an Ojibwe or an Anishinaabe beaded flower and a beaded flower of a Dakota woman. The colors are, are distinctly different for every tribe. It's a very graceful dance. Uh, there's a great deal of strength and stamina involved in a, a woman being able to dance in a, in a traditional way. That is sort of uh, translated as soldier. But it also means warrior, a protector, and helper of all the people. And they're the ones that fought to keep this land free. Even though the white man came here and fought the Indian people, when it came time for war, Indians picked up weapons and went to war for this land.
that was always the warrior who was first in defending Mother Earth. It was his duty to be first. I think it is a part of traditional values. I think it's a part of protecting against any outside invasion that uh, would endanger the people who are people who lived here. Sometime in the future, we believe that we will be back to protect uh, the environment and everything else. Sitting Bull said, you know, we live in two worlds now. We live in the white world and we live in the Indian world. As you go along in life, learn in the white world what you can use. What you can't use, let it go. Because, you know, we need that to survive today. As the Washichu people would say, just totally awesome. All right. Man, try star. Trying to uh, get a job in the inner city is uh, kind of rough on the Indian people that come from the reservations. And if, if, if the people that do the hiring and things, if they understand what the Anishinaabe people are about, you know, and, and that they're really caring people and sharing and, and very respectful people, then I think that they would hire them, you know, and, and they would bring that good feeling to that company or whatever, you know. Make me brave, you dancers out there. You make me strong, you make me brave. Hokai! This society is filled with inaccurate images of American Indians, and the images are easily manipulated. So, being able to show some sort of pride in our cultures and heritage at a powwow is very important for mental health all these promises of you you of you getting education and and um, you know everything will be rosy but when you do you find out that there's roadblocks there's roadblocks and you have to be a very strong person to to break through those roadblocks that racism and and you know that that goes on make yourself comfortable get yourself an Indian taco and being Indian competitive and climbing coffee. that corporate ladder or climbing whatever, you know, whatever, you know, that seems so foreign to many Indian people, you know, uh, and I did that too. I, you know, I wanted to be just as competitive as the next person and, and get ahead. That was a challenge, but you finally find out that it probably broke my spirit, probably. So I said, well, the hell with it, you know. <laughs> uh, they don't want me. Uh, Washitos, they don't want me. So I, I'll come back my way. If you are born in India, you can run away from it all your life, but it's still in you. If we have Indian problems and we have Indian questions, we can't find Indian answers in mainstream society. We have to look to our Indian ways. I think that it would have to be reestablishing that walk with the Creator. I mean, we are a praying people. As I sit here and the wind goes by, I realize that, that, that God is here, that Wakantanka is here to make this wind blow, to make my mouth move, and, uh, and the sound waves that, that go. The spirituality of American Indians is intertwined in everyday life. We're the original people here, and we, we've uh, tried to hold on to those those good ways because those good ways uh, helped us survive for thousands and thousands of years. Our way isn't better, it just works for us, you know. Kiss, kiss. As always, we Indian people give thanks to the great creator. The Lakota tradition is <clears throat> you're not measured by the richness, by how much you have, it's by how much you give away, how much you give. And, we give thanks to the great creator. I mean, it's, 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 it's such a great feeling to give somebody something and make them, make their tummies full, you know? It's, it's, when they're happy, you're happy. The wealth that a person possesses is their ability to help others, to, 
to, to share with others, to uh, be of service to others. My son graduated from high school. To me, that's, a, that's an accomplishment. Kids have a hard time doing that. And you look at statistics within society, the, the graduation levels for American Indians are very low. And so that's a big accomplishment for him as an Indian person. And I wanted to acknowledge that and say, thank you for getting that far with your life. <laughs> the day he graduated, when I went to his graduation, I told him that we were going to do this for him. I did a lot of sewing and a lot of um, craft work and saved and sacrificed all year to obtain those things. On behalf of her son, you know, for her love for him, for her son, she will sacrifice and she will give so that he will learn this. And someday when he has a son or a daughter, he will know what to do. They're going to play some shawls in the four directions. And Charlie's going to dance on these shawls. On the Powell Trail, we have numerous extended families. And so with the feeling that I had on the day that he graduated, I wanted to share that with other people and let them know how happy that I was that that happened. I laid four shawls out in front of him that he dances on. It's a special gift that goes to somebody else, but also it's an honor for him. It's so closely associated to the memorials to teach, to practice the giving of rather than receiving. If you love someone, you give in their name. My oldest son, Terry, when he was six, seven years old, he'd get off school, play around, go to bed. We carry him out to the car and head out about midnight for Eagle Butte. Wake up in the morning at 7.30, 7 o'clock. He comes from almost an all-white setting to an all-Indian setting. To be able to adapt to both, to be able to adjust to both, and you see the pride in him. See the real pride come out. See the real, where they feel real comfortable being with his own. It's identity, it's a must. It's a must to be able to sing. It's a must to be able to dance and participate in cultural, cultural events. That's all we have. Pijinasto. <laughs> Watch you. That's uh, the grass flattening dance. And these warriors were the ones who would move ahead of the encampment and they would se select the next uh, campsite. And when they did that, you know, these grass used to grow quite tall, you know, buffalo grass. They would pull these grass out and tie them in tufts around their knees and around their waist and their arms, you know. And then they would sing that special song. The singers would sing that special song. And so they, they would flatten that grass and dance and flatten that grass. So that's quite the movements that they have in, in their dancing. I dance as a, as a hunter, trying to sneak through the grass emulate grass so that the so that the um, the prey does not see me what my uh, uncles told me about uh, grass dance was uh, that it's a, a celebration dancing a celebration of uh, life dancing for good health for uh, good fortunes like that. When I get out there and dancing, I don't try to 
think of what I'm going to do. I try to focus on what that drum, that the beat, the beat of that drum, and then just go with the flow. dance itself, you do one thing on one side, same thing you do on the other side. Well, that's just, that's just like a, this road of life. You take this road of life, you're walking down. You take a road there, and you're walking down, and you do something on one side. It's like you take a step on one side. Automatically, you just you got to follow up on the other side. And to try to keep yourself on that road, you, you got to keep that balance in it. And that's the same way with this dance, you know, you gotta try to keep that balance with that, with that, what I was telling you, the mind, the emotion, the physical, and the spirit. When you're dancing, um, these things that are on, in the regalia, they, um, they bring out a shine, you know, you, you, you actually shine out there, you know. When you feel good about yourself, everybody can do that. It's not just it's not just for Anishinaabe people. It's for everyone. One day, a long time ago, I used to be the size of this young guy. And someday, this guy is going to be the same size as me. And I'm going to be old. One day, I'm going to be gone, and this guy is going to be taken over. That's the role that they're going to be having. And the way uh, I see it, uh, we uh, in our generation now are in a situation where we got to try to instill a lot of basic values of uh, of our teachings to this younger generation so they can carry on. Look, take care of your little ones. They're precious. They are a gift to you. Take care of it. Okay, we go to the South and Thunder Drum for the next little tribal. Hey, uh, okay, why not? Oh, it's a beautiful day. Beautiful, lovely day. And everybody's looking beautiful out there today. When I was pregnant with him, we went to powwows all over the place. And after he was born, when he was a baby, he, we took him to powwows, and every time he heard the music, he would either get wide awake and start kicking around, or otherwise it would put him to sleep. And then about one, one and a half, he started want, jumping around, wanting to go out and dance. He wanted to go out and follow his grandpa. It was his decision. We didn't say he had to dance. He, he just wanted to dance. And so what do you do when you first come to the powwow site and you pull into the campground? What's the first thing you do? Um. I'll just, I just come out, I'll come out and play, and I'll try to find my friends, and they will all play. And where are your friends from? Um, so, one of them are from Bismarck, Mandarin, and I got a lot of them everywhere, but I keep on forgetting sometimes. So you have friends from all over the country, huh? Yeah. And you see them only at powwows? Yeah. If you, if you watch the children, you know, you see the adults seeing, you know, re making new friends and reacquaintance with old friends. And it's the same way with these little ones. They have their own little set of friends out there that they see every weekend. So when they go out, they'll dance around, they'll dance on the edge, and they'll look. They'll look around looking for their friends, and they'll see them, and boom, they're gone. You know, so it's, they have their own little world, too. We want both of our children to know where they came from, you know, who, they, who they are. Hey, hey, hey. 
Harvey, what's your favorite part of a powwow? When you dance. I'm Ojibwe, and our traditional dance with women is uh, the jingle dress. This dress is worn in our ceremonies by the Ogichidakwe. Ogichidakwe is warrior woman, and she's a leader in the community and is chosen by the elders to set an example. The way you dance with these is you dance to make the jingles make sound, so you have to make those jingles um, dance. Even though they're on the top here, you still have to make them dance. And another thing you do is you don't go around in circles. You dance in a zigzag, you know, because life, too, isn't always a straight line. You know, you get off the path and you work to get back on. You might get off in another area and you work to get back on. It's more of a shuffle, the way that you dance. Also, when we stop, you know, and raise our fans at a certain time, we're honoring that drum again. The way that drum is dressed, some have little small jingles on them. So the jingles actually come from those ceremonial drums that were given to the Ojibwe people. The shininess has a significance to Indian people. So these snuff, the Copenhagen lids naturally fit in to things that we use. So we started uh, just trimming off a little bit of the edge and using the whole cover now to make this size of a jingle, what you see today. A story was given to me from an elderly woman. Her name was Maggie White. She was from Whitefish Bay, Ontario. When she was a young girl, she got sick and she couldn't walk. And her grandfather had a dream that she, he was to have a jingle dress made and he was to bring, have his granddaughter brought in in the ceremonial dance hall and sing her four songs in order for her to get well. So he asked some elderly woman in the community to make this dress. He gave him instruction. They put the dress on his granddaughter. They brought her in the dance hall. And the first song, these women had to help her dance around the drum. She could barely walk around the drum on the first song. The second song, they just had to hold on to her a little, and she started to walk. On the third song, they were able to let her go, and she could kind of, she could walk pretty good on her own. In the fourth song, she started to dance and was able to make it all on her own, and from that day on was able to walk and competed and in Canada and United States was a champion jingle dress dancer. There are many different stories about the Jingle Dress. There's stories from Mille Lacs, there's stories from Leech Lake. So there's a lot of meaning with this dress. People get well from wearing these dresses. A powwow is a place where one learns to find within themselves who they really are. This is very sacred to us, this circle. And, and this is why we, we, we don't like to see alcohol or drugs involved in, in a powwow. I'd go to powwows and I'd feel this. I'd feel it. I can't describe it. It's just this feeling I had that I wanted to dance and I wanted to be out there and it made me feel good. Because one of the things is uh, coming back from, from overseas and out of the Marine Corps, I really abused alcohol. And to me it was, a weekend was just meant drinking. Uh, I got off work, went down to the bar, cashed my check, and of course I had to spend half my check there at the bar. And uh, well, going to Paul's, it was a sober event. And 
the more I went to Paul's, the, the more I liked it, and I let, let go of the alcohol and the drug abuse by going to Paul's. And that's why I've always, I've always been real thankful that I found my way back. My name's Sake told me, he said, when Indians drink and drug, they drive their spirits away. You know, that spirit doesn't want to be around the alcohol and drugs, so it goes away. And that's why people walk around lost. And uh, when I used to go to powwows, I used to drink and have a good, thought I had a good time. But I would see some of those powwow people, how their life had changed through the, going the traditional way. And I used to feel somewhat, well, I used to feel damn envious of them because they could enjoy themselves and have a good time. You could see them dancing, having fun, without having to go that alcohol way, having to put something in your body to make you feel good. And at first, initially, I thought, well, I'll be just, I'll, I'll just sober up and I'll be satisfied that way. But there was something lacking. There was something lacking inside that sobriety made me, made me feel good, but there was something lacking and I didn't quite know what it was. I don't know, I luckily fell in and found the right way. Stumbled and, and found the right way. The, the getting high from being out there dancing to a good traditional song, you know, that feeling that you have is a true type of feeling that's in the experience for you that isn't artificially induced. I'm contented. I, I like this way now. I don't I don't feel a spit person anymore, you know? So. I was probably seven, eight years old, the first time that I'd seen it. And then I remember these girls came from California and they were doing this and I, and slowly it picked up and, and it, it's a more contemporary style of dance. This was probably in the 60s then. How about a nice big round of applause for song, ladies, fancy shawl. When I was younger, uh, a lot of places they called it graceful shawl. You did um, dainty, smaller steps, more um, graceful and closer to the ground, you know, but, but yet you had to be able to keep up with the men, you know, in time, you know, as fast as the songs went. my moccasins I have, I have these little um, designs on the, the foot. They represent uh, hoofs, like minor deer hoofs, because the deer, if you ever see them run and jump over fences, they're just so graceful. I mean, it's just kind of unbelievable how they, how they look. There's almost like they're not even touching or they're not tired or they're just, you know, free and floating. You know, that's when I dance, that's what that, you know, I feel really good like that, and that's the feeling that I guess I want to express. So I always put those, or have to beat those on my moccasins. A real good song, I just kind of go off into, I'm not really thinking about anything, I'm just um, living that song. I mean, just out there and, 
and I don't know, it's, it's real strange. Um, well, when I'm in really good shape and these certain songs come like that, it's like my feet, the toes don't touch the ground. I don't know how that could, could be, but I can feel it myself though. It's like, but the songs are just so, I don't know, they just really do something to me. Okay, a nice big round of applause for ladies' fancy soul dancers. Okay, hey, that was right on. We're all related, you know. We all come from one creator. Um, it's just a matter of uh, getting the the um, introductions out of the way, and once you have the introductions out of the way, then. Your, your talk comes fluently and you're having a good time. That's what Paul is all about, too. Meeting new people, meeting old friends. And uh, one of the terms they call it snagging. You know, boy meets girl and stuff like that. They call that snagging if they, they say that to announce, you know, don't be snagging, you know, or let her go or let him go, you know. Or just go out there and meet some friends and shake hands and do a bit of talking. We'll, be, we'll bring you back here in a little while. Now, I've also heard a phrase called snagging. <laughs> <laughs> what does that mean? Snagging just means finding a girlfriend at a powwow. <laughs> so it's a place you meet people? Yep, a lot of people from all over. Snagging means to, uh, for, for me, for a fella, to find uh, that beautiful Indian girl and, and, uh, and uh, see if you can't you know, have a relationship or whatever, because I mean, the powwow circuit goes not just from one place, it goes all over. So I mean, you might see that person that, how many different times in the summer. And so I mean, you kind of, it's kind of like, I guess they have summer love and all that kind of stuff. It's, you know, uh, anytime somebody like kits it off, I guess you call it snagging. <laughs> I know that's how I, that's like I met my wife on a power trail in uh, Eagle Beach, South Dakota. You know, we just met and then uh, we ended up going to the same school. Nine years ago, we met at a powwow, mm -hmm. and we just started out as friends. We hung out, hung around together, and that's how we were, we were friends. We walked around, talked, and I don't know, just kind of snuck up on me one day, I guess. That's all I can explain it. You could not marry someone in your own tribe, in your own band, especially in your own clan. So what you had to do is you had to go someplace else and get, get a wife. And this was the way you found, you found someone who was not of your own tribe. When you meet a new, a new person or, or someone that could, could um, possibly be a companion to you, you know, it feels rather good, you know, and, and, and it feels like a family. Beautiful dancing, beautiful songs here this evening. Uh, sure make me feel proud. Fancy dancing is probably one of the hardest dances to do in uh, powers. Hi, Doctor, ladies and gentlemen. Fancy dancing at its best. Oh, boy. You gotta keep in shape, you gotta uh, run, practice. Just like a sport, you can't just go out there and do it, you know, you gotta work at it, you know. Like I'm at the age of 32, I'm not really that old, but you know, I'm getting up there. Let me say welcome to our teen boys, fancy dancers. That's the way, fancy dancers. Well, a long time ago, from what I understand, there was traditional, then there was grass, and then there was fancy. It started down in, uh, in the south, someplace in Oklahoma, someplace down there. Like fancy dancing, and before it was, when it first came to, it was rainbow dancers, you know. They, to represent the rainbow, like uh, traditional dancers, they wear stuff with the animals and represent the animals that uh, they created put on this earth, you know, so we try to pass that on. The fancy dancers, uh, they have two bustles, the top and the bottom, and uh, some just have plain eagle feathers or plain turkey feathers. 
And some used uh, hackles, uh, chicken rooster hackles, and I used different colors. Some use the horse hair like I have, and some use ribbons. A lot of fancy dancers paint their face. All the fancy dancers wear the roaches, and they have the different deer tail colors here to, to uh, come with their outfits, you know, their, their colors. Some fancy dancers you notice they have the rocker that goes back and forth. I have what these call spinners, you know, that's called a northern style. And uh, I know one down in Nebraska a couple of summers ago. And everybody had rockers, you know, because that's more of a southern style. And some of my friends were singing and they said, hey, who's this guy with the spinners? You know, he's got some nerve coming down there, you know, wearing spinners, because uh, it's. Southern style is fast and rockers and all that, and I'm more of a northern guy, and that's just the way I am, you know. It's like when I dance, it's like a fire, so it's like a blazing fire or something, you know, when I'm spinning. dancing it's fire <laughs> so I'll score a cheap one don't stand too close <laughs> Oak Chiapo means come and help each other. Come and let's do it together. Hokahe Oak Chiapo. To give each other strength, give each other words of encouragement. Gratefulness for you to be here. A gratefulness that we met today and talked. And that's what the power is about. It's a celebration of people coming together to share and communicate. No matter what part of Mother Earth you are, that part of land is relative, you know, and whoever walks on it is your friend, is your Kodan. That's how we look at it. When we come to a celebration, a powwow, it's like a bunch of birds coming together to communicate, to talk about things, about life. It's, it's about a new beginning uh, that they would create for each other, for two people and then they will fly away, you know, and that's exactly what will happen here. We come together this weekend, after it's finished, we will be going home in our directions, and the power will be finished, and we will go home feeling a different beginning, a different beginning has happened.
Powwow is made possible in part by Target Stores, Dayton's, and Mervyn's through the Dayton Hudson Foundation and by the Corporation for Public Broadcasting through the Central Educational Network.